scholar said that the book of John is perhaps the most profound book ever written. We'll uh, plumb it as best we can, but we'll not get to the all of it because it's just uh, every time you go through, there's more stuff, more stuff, more stuff. <clears throat> chapter one was outstanding, but chapter three is, is so <clears throat> rich and so meaningful because we get our very uh, uh, hope for salvation from that. And so we'll just look at it. Chapter three, John. The first word that is not there, it's now. Now there was a man. Why now? The previous uh, uh, paragraph said that there were a lot of people that saw the miracles of Jesus, but and they believed on him <clears throat> because of that. Not any depth or reason or commitment, but they, but they liked that and saw that and believed him. But Jesus would not commit to them. They weren't really receiving him. We would call them perhaps an unsaved church member. Uh, but now there is a man, Nicodemus, and I think the inference is that he can trust. Because here comes one with an open mind, questions, and, and, and really wanting to know something. So here was a man, Nicodemus, a man of the Pharisees, and the Pharisees were what? Separatists. They really tried to watch the law. They really did their best. I know they get they get a black black mark from us because they're uh, hypocritical and so forth. But most of them really tried, really tried, and they and they taught that. So Nicodemus. A ruler, a ruler of the Jews, which means he was a higher up in the Sanhedrin. This man came to Jesus by night. Now, no doubt he came tonight to Jesus by night in order to have a, an audience with him, quiet, alone, in a way. Some had made him a coward to come by night. My grandfather was a very, he was a Christian and had very simple. He said he came to Jesus that night because he was under conviction and he just wouldn't wait till morning. <laughs> and he may be right, but, uh, but he came to Jesus by night and where he met with him, we don't know where Jesus was staying, on a rooftop or in a tent or somewhere, but he said, uh, said to him, Rabbi, there are three terms uh, that Jews would give teachers, uh, Rab, Rabbi, and Rabban, Rabbi is the middle one, but it's a, it's, it's, it's a word of respect. He, he understood that he had a title worthy of respect. And he said, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher. Now, a teacher is not the word rabbi. It's the word he teaches. Dasko, it means I teach like a school teacher. You came to teach us. You have something to say from God. I have come here tonight to hear from you. I know you've come from God. Nobody can do these signs, attesting miracles that you do, except God be with him. You have a word from God. I came tonight to see what that word is. I am a teacher and I, and I want to know what God has to say. No one can, no one can do this. I know you came from God and no doubt he was familiar with John and John pointing to another who came. And so he comes just simply, we haven't heard from God in 400 years. Now here comes John the baptizer with a word. And now you come and you obviously have come from God. And I want, I want to hear from you. And Jesus just jumped right into it, didn't he? Jesus answered and said to him, I have come from God, and here's the word from God. Unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of heaven. That's, that's pretty stern. That's pretty quick. It's almost like a rebuke, but it's not. What he's saying to him is, Nic is Nicodemus, 
you've got to have a new life. You've got to have a new heart. You've got to have a new way of seeing things. You can't see, you can't enter. There's no way to understand the kingdom of God unless you have changed in you. Now, remember, John is not just writing a story. He is writing for people when and where. Now. Now, to the Jews and to the Gentiles, he's writing for the future. He, he understands what's going on here, but he's writing in order that we might understand this. He's writing in order that on a day Nicodemus would come to realize this. But but it, but it wouldn't immediately, but you know, they, they meet first just face to face. Uh, why have you come? I've come to tell you this. You must be born anew, literally born from above. God has to come into your life in a new way for you to see that. This would just startle me if I were Nicodemus and it did him. Uh, immediately he's thinking, I can't become uh, in my mother's womb again. This, this is impossible. And so now they begin to meet mind to mind. How can a man be born when he's old? He can't enter into his mother's womb again. Can he? Now, Jesus is going to tell him that which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. And, and these are perfect tense. If you are born, you're born forever. If you just remain flesh, you remain flesh forever. But that which is born of spirit is, is spirit. You must be born again. Now, Nicodemus, of course, did not understand this at all. And so he's going to get to it in a moment. So Jesus says, the wind blows. Now, wind in Greek and wind in Hebrew and breath, wind, and spirit are the same word. Pneuma is the word for spirit. It's the word for wind. It's the word for breath. Ruach is the Hebrew word for wind, for spirit, and for breath. And so he's saying the wind, the ruach, the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound thereof. You don't know where it's coming or where it's going. Now, as, as I read this, and, and know all of us having received Christ, we did the same thing to be saved, but we all came from a different uh, background. And, uh, and so when, when I finally went to church with my wife, I, I'd gone, I was raised Catholic. But I'd, I'd visit, I dated girls before and gone to church and just, it was okay. But somehow when I went on this Sunday and the preacher preached and it wasn't all that important, but when they gave the invitation, something happened in me. I, I, I can't, exp you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> if you don't, you ain't saved. <laughs> Something happened in me. Where did that come from? Why did it come? Why now and not then? I don't know. The spirit goes where it wants to. The wind goes where it wants to. I don't know where it's coming from, though I do know where the spirit's coming from, but I did not know. I managed to white knuckle through that service. But she took me back the next week. And the next week we sat a little further back and I sat on the end. And, and when the invitation came about the second verse, I, I left, I went out the front door. I could not take that. The wind was blowing again. Where'd he come from? I had all week, I was okay. When I got there, I was, I was okay out there in the front of the church. There were a couple of deacons out there smoking anyway. <laughs> the third time she went she she got me on the inside and she was on the outside and we were third pews from the front where can I go 
<laughs> and the same thing came over me. The spirit came over me. Where did he come from? I know now. Then she really cheated. When he gave the invitation, she got up, went forward and joined the church by letter. I was about three steps behind her to give my heart to Christ. Now, immediately, immediately, is, and, and I'm going to make this, uh, let's explain this a little. Immediately when I stood and stepped in the aisle, I was saved. When I went down and talked with him, I don't know what he said. I was so excited and so overcome, but so overjoyed. I don't know what he, I must have given the right answers because they baptized me that night. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, <laughs> that's the spirit. You don't know where it's coming from. Why does it come? It comes to, to get you saved. So, so he said, Nicodemus, you ought to understand this. And Nicodemus said, how can these things be? And Jesus said, you're a teacher. You don't know this. Let me take you back. If Nicodemus is supposedly knows the scripture, right? Yeah. Jesus hardly brought anything out that was not already in the scripture. And, and I, I can go back to uh, Ezekiel 36. And let me read a couple of, couple of verses to you. God is speaking, moreover, I will give you a new heart. When the Bible speaks of heart, what it's talking about? Your blood beater? He's talking about you. He's talking about you, the inside, the real man inside. He, he's talking deeper than uh, uh, anything we'd understand. And so he says, I will put my spirit, I will give you a new heart, which means a new beginning, a new start, a new understanding. And I will put a new spirit within you. Now, when you were saved, did you receive a new spirit? Yes. Do you remember it? Yes. Was there anything ever like that in your life? When, when, when the spirit moved in and the joy and the lightness and, and the perception that somehow I have become right with God. You know, as raised a Catholic, I spent many a Saturday night going to confession and talking about my little sins because I wasn't going to mention the big ones. <laughs> <laughs> And, and going out and, and the penance would be 10 Hail Marys or maybe it throw in a couple of our fathers. And I do that and felt like, okay, I'm okay. Maybe I make it till next Saturday night. Uh, but nothing changed. Now I realize this later as a teenager, but this, this is meaningless. I mean, it, nothing, something ought to be going on, but it wasn't. Said, so I'll put a, a, a new spirit within you and I'll remove the heart of stone. What is the heart of stone? The one that would not perceive what you ought to be in God's eyes. And I'll give you a heart of flesh, which means tenderness, understanding, being able to grasp it. And I will put my spirit in you and cause you to walk in my statutes. Now, after you gave your heart to Christ, did you begin to walk in his statutes? I didn't say, did you do it? I said, did you begin to do it? Yes, yes, you begin to do it. I'm, I'm still working on some stuff. I don't know about you, you probably got it all down, but I'm only 94. I've still got some stuff to work on. <laughs> now, and then in Ezekiel 37, you've heard the story of the dry bones. Yeah. In verse 90, it says, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath. What breath? Thus saith the Lord, 
Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain. Now the, the, the skin had come, the bones had come together, everything was there, but they were dead until they received breath. breath. Adam was made completely out of dirt, and we need to remember we're made out of dirt, that's why we have a problem. Adam was made out of dirt into a complete human being, but he laid there in hate until God did what? Breathe into him until the breath came. Thus saith the Lord, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they've come to life. Now Jesus is going to Nicodemus I think he's bringing out, trying to bring out a remembrance of all this stuff that the wind, the spirit moves where it wants to, and it moves. And with this breath comes a new life and a new heart. You're a teacher and don't understand this. What he's trying to say is, Nicodemus, go back to your teaching. Go back to the Old Testament. Go back to things that you know. This is not brand new. God, only God can make something brand new. Have I lost you? You grasp it? What he's what telling him and what born anew, born from above must be. We're born below, we must be born above. When we're born here, we have a relationship with the family. When we're born from above, we have a new relationship. So Jesus answered and said, you're a teacher and don't understand this, don't understand these things. And I, I would hope that would come to mind, Nicodemus, a, a number of things that they said. But Jesus is not going to just tell him, remember, he's going to tell him something. I heard a, a guy say one time, and I've forgotten how important he was that Jesus never actually said, I am God. I think he said it over and over. I think constantly he was saying that uh, to people, not just I and my father are one, but he that's seen me has seen the father. He's yeah. constantly, he, he's saying this. Now he's going to tell it to Nicodemus. If I've told you earthly things, you don't believe, how can you believe I tell you heavenly things? Now, verse 13 no one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, even the Son of Man. Is Son of Man a brand new term here? No, it's an Old Testament term. Daniel, Daniel and, and Ezekiel, but Daniel had in mind who the Son of Man would be, would be the Savior. And so what he's saying to Nicodemus I am that son of God. I think Nicodemus suspected something more than just a teacher. But now he's saying to him, I'm your Messiah. I'm your anointed one. I am the son of man that Daniel spoke about so many, so many centuries before. I came from where? heaven and if I came from heaven I came with a word from where God isn't that an amazing wonderful thing he who descended from heaven who else has come from heaven nobody Jesus is telling him I came from the Father with a word and that word is, you, you need a new beginning. Now, when we talk about uh, man, let's, let's, and born again, let me tell you something I've said before, and if, if you've not heard it, don't leave the room until I explain it. You do not have a soul. <clears throat> you got it? 
You are a soul. You have a body. Which is most important? Which is going to live forever? Which really needs a birth in order to live forever? The real man, the real man, the soul who lives inside that body. Sometimes the, the New Testament talks about the body as a tabernacle or a tent. What is a tabernacle or a tent? It's temporary. It's not going to last. In my ministry, I have presided over 400 funerals. We buried a body. Who was in that body that we buried? Nobody. That person's gone. And so that's what he's telling him. There is a thing inside you. The real man is the soul. It is the soul. It is the part of man that's going to live forever that needs a brand new start. We're born without that. I think when we get to heaven, about the second person we're going to see is Adam. And he's going to be bent over where we can kick him in the britches. <laughs> I mean, he, he did this and now we have inherited all that he left, which of course is sin. <clears throat> he was body, soul, spirit. And when he sent God took his spirit out of him, left the man's spirit. And we're all born with just three pieces of the pizza. When we're born again, God puts his spirit back. That's what it is to be born of the spirit. God inserts his spirit into the real man, which is the man inside, which is the soul. The body, the body can only do what the mind tells it to do. It can't go anywhere. It can't sit. It can't stand. It can't walk. It can't talk unless something up here tells it to do that. The body is just something that uh, has to be commanded to do. Remember that. And it's the spirit of God that ought to control the soul of man, which ought to control the body of man. Okay. Then he says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Do you remember that story? That uh, Israel wanted to go through a land and the people said, no, you can't go through here. And so they had to wander further around. And the more they wandered, the more they complained, complained. God got tired of that. And he sent fiery serpents, little snakes of some kind, little, and they bit, and some of them died, and some of them were sick. And so the people prayed, Moses, help us. And Moses went to God, and God said, Get a staff, make yourself a brazen serpent, an image of, of that of that serpent. Put it on a pole. You know that's still the symbol of a doctor. Serpent on a pole, and go go about it. And uh, I think I, I read a sermon by Spurgeon that said, "You just go from place to place, tent to tent, hold it up, say, look and live, look and live, look and live.' Was it the look? It was the trust in that look. And if you looked." Suddenly you were immune from the bite. <clears throat> when you had the new birth, you looked and you were immune from the bite of the deadly serpent. Now, so must the son of man be lifted up. Do you think Nicodemus is beginning to catch on who he is? I don't mean completely. I think he is because Jesus repeats this, the son of man must be lifted and must is a very important word, must be lifted up. There's no other way to be saved but for the son of man to be lifted up. When was he lifted up? On the cross. 
on yeah, the cross. Also, during the ascension. Yeah, we, we could say the whole thing, death, burial, and, and ascension, lifted up. But lifted up, you ever see the cross in your heart and your mind? And looked at it. There was a time that you did. You may not have knew what you were doing. But that look gave you salvation. That's what he's talking about. Lift it up. Of course, lift it up on the cross. But if that's all that happened, we'd still be dead. But he didn't remain there. He, he rose again and then ascended into heaven. And is heaven in heaven doing what? At the right hand of God. At the right hand of God doing what? Interceding. Interceding for us. Interceding for us. It's as if we have a lawyer there and, and God, I'll say you're lying because I don't lie. If, if, if you lie, he's saying, I paid for that. I paid for that. I paid for that. They're clean, they're clean, they're clean, they're mine. And so it is lifted up in verse 15 that whosoever believes, boy, that is a deep word. The stew in the Greek means I believe. But you know the same word is used in Hebrews chapter 11, which is the chapter of faith. That faith and believe are the same word. Now, when you go back to Hebrews and you find out here's Moses, here's Abraham, and all that he mentioned, what did they do? One thing they obeyed God. To believe means to obey God. It doesn't mean to have a belief. It means to do a belief. That's why I say it, the moment I rose from that pew and stepped into the aisle, I had done all that I had heard to do. The pastor had said, if you want to accept Christ, step out and come down. I obeyed. How? I just stepped out into the aisle. Did I know what I was doing? Did I understand the plan of salvation? No. But I did what God told me to do at the time. That's what belief is. Belief can be done in a lot of words. Uh, in my Hebrew study Bible, the word belief is usually translated trust. Uh, mentioned several times, it's not new to me, but you trust that chair, don't you? Otherwise, you would not have squatted in. I mean, you gave your whole self to it. That's what it means to give your whole self to trust, to believe, to obey. It's not just something you have, it's something you do. Whosoever believes, trusts, obeys, follows, commits in trust, however you want to put it, may have eternal life, life beyond the ages. And it's not life means one day I'll live. No, it means it starts now. Your eternal life, my eternal life begin on that Sunday morning in that little Baptist church in Dallas, Texas. I am living eternal life right now. It will become everlasting life. It, it already has as far as, because Jesus said, he that believe in me, though he die, no, he said, will never die. That's what he told Mary and Martha. He that believeth in me will never die. The body may be put in a coffin or in an oven, but the man will never die. Uh, the, uh, 1873, I was in a voting accident. In 1873? 19. Oh, okay. 
<laughs> the beard fooled me. You got a few years on me. <laughs> but anyway, I was in a boating accident. <clears throat> and uh, I saw my body floating in the water. And I was being drawn up. It's absolutely beautiful. Mm -hmm. And it was my time. And I'll never forget that. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Yeah. Mm. Let, me, let me ask you now, CD, do you have a fear of death? No, absolutely not. Most of us, let's be honest, there, there is a, not being dead, but the process. Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, uh, being dead would be fine, but the process is something. Now, I have been as a pastor with several people who uh, were waiting to die. I remember the first one, I was a seminary student, but a pastor, Truett uh, Chapel in Dallas with First Baptist Church. And Brother Potter lay on the bed and I lay there with, the, I, I sat there with the family. And as we uh, sat there and suddenly from comatose, she said, I see Jesus and she was gone. Uh, that, that's the way it is. My wife had a anaphylactic reaction to a shot, penicillin shot, went to the hospital and I, I was sitting there watching the doctor and the, I couldn't see her, but I could see the doctor. And he looked at me and he said, and she had the same kind of experience. And she told of, of that, of being so near, seeing her body as if she had left and, and seeing, knowing where she was going and yet coming back. Uh, and when she died, well, she was in the hospice for a week and uh, she died on a Friday morning, but on a Wednesday night, Somehow at one or two o'clock in the morning, Dan and I got on cots and slept there. Suddenly, she'd been so quiet. Suddenly, Lord, Lord, I want to praise you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. And begin to wave her hands and, and to thank Jesus and look for him. And when she finished, she just was comatose. She kept breathing, but she was no more. That's how it is. Eternal life has already begun. And so dying is just leaving the body or this body and going into, into something else. <laughs> now, e eternal life, why, why? For God so what? Let me ask you a question. I'm not sure you can answer. What does the word soul mean? It means life. God, soul. The word that comes to my mind is enough. God loved us enough that he gave. A gift is a gift. Now, now, when Jesus, God gave us Jesus, he came to earth, he did what he did, he went back to heaven, but God is still giving us Jesus. He's at the right hand of God, but he's interceding for us, he's pleading for us, his Holy Spirit comes to us, he's still giving us Jesus. He never stops giving us, he is a gift forever. And when we get to heaven, we will see that even better. And when we get to, to the heaven on earth and the finality of it all and walk with him and see him, we'll understand that even better. He is still giving us Jesus. He gave us Jesus. He didn't loan us Jesus. He didn't make Jesus a symbol. He gave us, let me be more succinct. He gave me Jesus. He is a gift and a gift forever. Isn't that a wonderful thing? 
Why? Because we didn't deserve it. Right. God simply loved us. He simply loved us. Wow, that's 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 overwhelming. Just overwhelming. His only uniquely born son, that whosoever what's in him? And what does that mean? All of the above. Trust, obey, follow, commit, all of the above. It didn't just mean, okay, I, I believe, I'm going to baptize, I'm a church member, now let's get on with life. No, life changed. Did it not? Yes. If it had not, you would not be here. There are a lot of folks who chose not to be here, who could be here, but this isn't, God thing is not that important. You, you understand what I'm talking about? That God becomes instantly the thing important in your life. Now, it should not perish, that is, be disintegrated, but have an eternal and new kind of life. For God did not send his son into the world to judge the world. He didn't come to say, Nicodemus, I am the son of God and you ain't. I'm the son of God and you're a sinner. He, he didn't come to do that. He came to show Nicodemus how he could become part of what the son of God was. I have a question. Yes. I've always been bothered by it in John 3, 16, when it says, so not perish. Because I was taught that no one really perishes. The, the wicked go to hell, but they don't die. That's right. It's an eternal death. It's an eternal perishment. You don't you don't cease to exist, but but you're eternally perished. It's it's gone. It's over. There's you're no removed from the presence of God. Yeah, that's there, what that means. There's no more life, really life. <clears throat> but uh, exactly. Okay, thank you. I also was uh, you know, just speaking of. He said eternal darkness. Yeah. That you're uh, not only are you in hell, but that is eternal darkness and separation from God. Mm -hmm. So so Jesus came that we mentioned in, in chapter one. Jesus did not come to show the glory or the power of God. And here he did not come to judge. He came to save. He came to touch lives and save lives and change lives that lives may not be separated from God, remain separated from God, but might, might come back to God. But he who does not believe has been judged already. If you don't believe because of uh, Adam's sin we inherited from Adam, but if Adam hadn't done it, who would have? You would have. I would have. If it hadn't been Adam, it'd been somebody. But it happened to be the first guy. And the first guy made a decision for all of us. I made those dumb decisions myself. But it is not believed. He'd been judged already. Until you believe, you're judged. Now, God understands, and God knows who you are and what's going to happen. But without God, you die without God. Your body dies without God. What happens to the man inside? Eternal darkness. Simply because he's, God only asks to believe. Well, that's simple. It's not really that simple, is it? to follow, to commit, to obey, to do all that he asks us to do. It's, it's, it's not hard. It's simple to grasp, but, but it's tough sometimes to be a part of that constantly. But we're growing toward that. And simply lost because he's not believed. That's all God asks. 
And this is the judgment that the light, not light, but the light, who is the light? When Jesus comes into the world and reveals God, everything is different. Nobody had seen God. Moses saw the backside, but that's that's not nobody has seen God anybody. But Jesus said, He that has seen me has seen the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen God. What you say, I am God. Watch me walk, watch me talk, watch me work with people, watch my temper, watch what makes me angry, watch what's make me joy. That's God. Pure love. The light has come into the world. And men love darkness. Why do men love darkness rather than light? Because darkness hides their sins. Exactly, exactly. Uh, why were you told when you were a kid to be home by 1030 or 11 or 12? Why were you told that? You get much later than that and bad things are happening. <laughs> Bad things are happening. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, this guy, we don't want to hear his testimony right now. <laughs> but but he, he understands what this darkness can be. And I think all of us doing it for we love darkness. There was a time loving darkness means this. I want to do what I want to do. And if I'm, uh, let me just put it like I would say, if I were a Christian, real Christian, like my grandfather, he didn't have lust. He doesn't think about lying. He doesn't think about stealing. He doesn't think about, uh, Papa, I thought was a saint walking on earth. Papa had problems too, and I'll learn later. But everyone in verse 20 who hates, who does evil, he hates the light. Now, why did I walk out of that church on that Sunday morning? I didn't want the light. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't understand it. But I, I they were, they, well, I, I think you understand. I think, uh, and, and, and I know in my case, I didn't want to give up the life that I had. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, I know it was wrong. But, uh, you know, I, I did the same thing, uh, white knuckles and everything. Absolutely. And I, I leave that church like it was on fire. Yeah, glad to be out of there. All right. They call it an invitation. I call it a torture chamber. Boy, my mind. Ooh, I don't want to go, and I won't have to go through that again. Lest his deeds be exposed. What can you hide from God? But have you ever done anything you hope God didn't see? <laughs> I don't mean lately. Verse 21, but he who practices the truth comes to the light. If you want, and what it, Pilate asked the question, what is truth? <clears throat> Let me ask you, what is truth? Jesus. In a person, it's Jesus. My word would be reality. Truth is reality. Truth is the way it is. Mm -hmm. The way it is, is God. The way it is, is Jesus. That's the standard. That's the truth. It's reality. And the reality is who owns this world? God, Jesus made it, owns it, and forever will. Though we have the God of this world and we know what he is, but we also understand he's like a dog on a leash. He can do what he wants to do if God permits. But this is our father's world. So he is, but he who practices the truth, reality, if reality is there is God, I am a sinner, here's Jesus, I can believe and be saved. What should you do? 
If you just are a right thinking person, what should you do about that? If I remain a sinner, I'm going to hell. If I accept Jesus, I'm going to heaven. If you just think about it, what decision should you make? I mean, even without the Holy Spirit, if that's just a question. And so that his deeds may be manifested or made known as having been wrought or made in God. Now that, that pretty well closes the Nicodemus part. We'll see Nicodemus another time or two in John. We'll see him as he addresses the Sanhedrin and said, we ought not be judging this man. And then we'll see him again with Arimathea to uh, take the body of Jesus. Secret disciple, that took a lot of, that took a lot of nerve to do what he did when he did it. Uh, any question now about the Nicodemus part? Man, that took nearly all our time. But, uh, I'm going to go on. Because I don't think the rest will take. Now, after these things, Jesus and his disciples went into the land of Judea, Judea, and there he was spending time with them and baptizing. But, but John is going to tell us in chapter 4, Jesus did not personally do the baptism, but his disciples did that for him. But it was Jesus who was in charge of baptizing, baptizing because of him. So Jesus was still preaching the message of John, and John still alive, and he was also baptizing in Anan near Salim because there was much water there and they were coming to be baptized. John had not been thrown into prison. There arose a discussion on the part of John's disciples about a Jew, about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond Jordan, who would that be? That'd be Jesus. To whom you born witness, he's baptizing and people are going to him. John answered and said, and here's the thing you need to remember and I need to remember. A man can receive nothing except it's been given to him from heaven, which means God has a ministry for you, a ministry for me, may not fit anybody else. When I was a, a, a mission pastor at First Dallas, what do you think my dreams were to become? W.A. Criswell. <laughs> I could see eventually, eventually. Did it happen? No. Well, Why? There's only one version. Version it Pardon? A little version. It <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and so my largest pastorate was something like Trinity at First Southern Baptist Church in Fresno, about 500 people, more or less, depends on what. And uh, But Dr. Criswell did what he did because he was commissioned and given what it took to do that. I had my ministry and it's what God equipped me to do. You have your ministry and you do what God equipped you to do. You're not equipped to do what somebody else is equipped to do. We're not all equal. A spiritual gifts, but you put us all together. We cover, we cover the door. When I was a mission pastor at the, uh, Dallas, Dr. Crystal, the first Baptist church would baptize about a thousand people a year. I baptized 50 of those in that little mission. There were six missions. We all fit together to make that thousand. He did this, we did this, we fit together. Your ministry, my ministry, if we work, we fit together. 
You can only do what God equips you to do. Don't try to be more than that. I've tried and I fell on my face, but you don't need to know that story. Man could have seen nothing so they given. And so what, what John is saying is, God gave me to be the voice in the wilderness, and I'm thrilled to have been that. That's all he gave me. I'm not the Christ. I told him I wasn't the Christ. And you bear witness that I said I'm not the Christ. I'm not better than I am. I am what I am, and I do what I do. <clears throat> but I have been sent before him. My job was done. He who has the bride is who? The bridegroom. What does the best man do at a wedding? He hands the ring and then he's through. It's as if he said, my part in here is done. I've carried this ring for you, and there you are. Now, it was a little deeper in a Jewish <laughs> reading, but uh, we'll not go there. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices because of the bridegroom's voice, and, his, and this joy of mine has been made full. I got to do what God sent me to do. That's a joy. That's a joy this old man has, that he called me to be a pastor teacher and to get to do it just fills my, joy, my, my heart with joy. He must, he absolutely has to increase, but I must what? I've got to fade away. Why? He's the message, I'm not. And the, and the bride, the best man, simply slips away. He's through with it. <clears throat> he that comes from above. Now, uh, probably verse 31 through the rest of it is, is John just talking or writing. Who, could, who, who comes from above is above all. That was Jesus. He who is of the earth is of the earth and speaks the earth, but he who comes from heaven is above all. What he has seen and heard, that he bears witness, no man receives his witness. First hand. But he who has received his witness, and John uses the word witness 47 times in this book, that he who received his witness, the witness of who Jesus is, set his seal on this, that God is true. God is true. God sent Jesus. That is the absolute truth. For he whom God has sent speaks the word of God. For he gives the spirit without measure. God has sent to us Jesus, who gives us the word without measure. In other words, when we read everything Jesus has said, there's nothing left unsaid that we need to know. <clears throat> Full measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things to his hand. So he that believeth on the Son, there's that word again. How many times is that word in the in John? Believe. Believe. It's 114 times. 114 times. I counted over and over. I came up with 99, but I kept finding every time I'd read it, find out. So well, there's all sorts of variations. Of yeah, it. there is, like in trust and yeah. commit. Yeah. And uh, when I count them, I wasn't that smart. Well, I had a program that helped oh, me. Yeah. <laughs> I wish I'd have had that. Uh, maybe I'd have been at first Dallas. He that believes the Son has eternal, but he does not what? Obey, believe, obey, the Son shall not see light. This means you got to do more and just say, well, I went down to the front and I gave my heart to Jesus and now I'm on my own. Paul talks about that a whole lot. 
If you do that, you'll not see life. You don't have life. But the wrath of God abides on him. Jesus gave us the ability, the right, and the way to escape <laughs> the wrath of God. If God has a love, God has a wrath. Okay, is there anything you say? I wish Bill had said this. <clears throat> Questions? Bill, jump in. I'm at the uh, last verse, chapter three. My Bible, the NIV says, uh, whoever rejects the Son will not see life. For God's wrath remains on him. Mm -hmm. It begs the question. Uh, I've kind of always thought in my mind that God's wrath will be upon him, and it remains in first. That it's always been there. God's wrath has always been there on him. Yes. So which is it? That's the way I see it. We're born a sinner. A sinner in the eyes of God is one without salvation. But it said that. 316 says, For God so loved the world. I mean, he loved all mankind and he gave his only son. So that, that does not indicate wrath. And when it says God's wrath remains upon him, that refers that it's always been there and it always will be if he doesn't believe. Yes. Is that a question or a statement? <laughs> well, I'm trying to clarify it in, in my mind because. Um, I think we're, we're born. Sinners, which means we're under God's wrath until we believe. Well, wrath at first, but I was saying wrath at first, anger. You know, you, no, well, no, it does not. It does, it's it's not everybody like wrath at first, it's deep. That's that's it, an emotional, it, it's deeper. It means you're separated from God. Anger is one thing, wrath is much deeper. Wrath has in it. A punishment, a separation. Wrath is not just I'm angry with you. Wrath means you're worthless. You're, you know, you're, you know we all have the concept of God. You know, we're separated from God as long as we don't believe it. And man's sin separates from Him all the way to reconcile to Him through faith in Christ. Uh, and that clarifies, you know, this that that clarifies. That's my mind now. Thank you. I think if a, if a guy lives his whole life and never trusts in Christ, he's lived his whole life and will live forever under the wrath of God. The only, the only part is about, you know, and I have always, you know, known, you know, because even my grandmother who witnessed to me and witnessed to me and witnessed to me, that, you know, that. You know, she said that, uh, you know, you're literally born in sin. Even as a baby, you're born in sin. But because you're a baby, you know, because I had a twin, believe it or not, you poor people, there could have been two. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I had a twin that died at birth. And so, uh, anyway, I know that because, you know, because the a baby is innocent. But, uh, you know, and I have a long, hard time understanding that, you know, that, well, the, the child was innocent because it was not of the age of understanding. Mm -hmm. And so it took me a long time because grandma always said, well, we're all born in sin. She said, we have the sin nature in us from birth because of that. You know, and she tried to explain that to this dense little mind of mine, you know, that, uh, you know, but God does not hold babies accountable because, you know, right now we'd have uh, 60 million aborted babies that uh, would have been uh, sent to hell you know, mm -hmm. but yeah. uh, can I clarify? Mm -hmm. Jump in, Dale. Here, Bill. Let, let me here. jump in, Dale. In. Let me try to clarify this. The Bible uses the expression the world, the flesh, and the devil. This is how it describes sin. We are born into this world prone to sin, but, and that's the world. 
And by an act of rebellion against God at a certain age, we commit uh, sin. We become sinful. And when we, and that's called the, the, the flesh. <coughs> And then, then it goes into the, the, the devil. The devil is where when we commit this act of rebellion against God, we turn ourselves over to the evil one and we become full-blown sinners. And, and, the, and that's the world, the flesh, and the devil. So when a baby is born, he, he is prone to sin, but he hadn't sinned. He hadn't become a sinner yet because he hadn't committed an act of rebellion against God. So he's protected by God's, in fact, the Old Testament calls it the covenant. He's protected by the covenant that God has made with humankind, not just uh, not just Israel, humankind. Until what age? At, at a certain age, we don't know. That usually in in he in the Hebrew thought, it was around twelve or thirteen years old. Well, you don't. Have we call that the age of accountability in the Baptist faith. <laughs> now you know. You don't have to teach a child to lie because I started noticing, you know, because I take care of my two grandkids at, you know, five days a week. You don't have to teach them. To teach them. <laughs> you know, and I'll, I'll ask them, were you into grandpa's stuff? No. <laughs> <laughs> the bottom line of sin is selfishness. I do this because that's what I want to do, and that becomes sin in, in, in a part, and that's the thing we have to deal with. And, uh, in Psalm verse 2, it says in verse 11, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. And it says, verse 12, kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish from the way. And his rest is kindled but a little, and blessed are they that put their trust in him. I think we, if we get in condemnation, really it doesn't come from God. You know, he doesn't condemn it. And so I think, you know, that the, you know, the you know, God, God forgets, once we confess him, God forgets it. And no one <coughs> yeah, he, he chooses, he it. chooses not to yeah. remember it. Yeah. I have a question. Does everyone have this choice? Say you're in the middle of Africa and everybody explodes. Uh, that's beyond my pay grade. <laughs> <laughs> it, it really is. I, I've heard guys try to explain that, and I really got off of uh, Tony Evans by explaining that you could really be saved if you wanted to do the right thing and wanted. No, there's no other name given them in heaven whereby we must be saved except the name. I, I, I've got to draw the line there. Okay. Yeah. I've got to draw. If that guy in Africa is not saved, it's because we haven't gone there to tell him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, with the internet and everything. Uh, yeah, it's a different world now. Even they don't have the internet. They, they, uh, they, uh, yeah, but many of them. Radio and, and there's this yeah. so, so many ways. And yeah, and I understand. Uh, I've heard people say that, uh, say in Iran, there are people having dreams about about Christ. But it's always Christ. It's got to be Christ. Got to be Jesus. I use the word Christ, the Messiah, which is the Anointed One, which is King Jesus. But uh, I'm I'm going to hold the line. I I I can't answer for that guy in Africa who never heard and dies. I. To follow that question, I think there are those who would say God has got that figured out because he has determined this person or that person will accept it. And, and I can't follow that because I don't believe the Bible supports that. And, uh, uh, I don't see the, the scriptures supporting right. that. Um, there's two two things at work. One is the call for us to go tell, and the other is for every person to respond to the amount of revelation they've been given. So somebody in Africa who sees that there is creation and um, <clears throat> is is starting to form a question in their mind, where did this come from? I believe that God 
will give the next step of revelation to every person who seeks that next step. If we decide in our own humanity, well, I'm going to create this vision of who God ought to be, who this creator ought to be, we're going to take that path and it's going to lead us away from God. But if we have if opened our mind to there's somebody bigger than me, and I need to find out who that is, he's going to bring another step of revelation in our lives. But I'm going to be like the church of Christ are about pianos. If, if the Bible speaks, I'm there. If it's silent, I'm silent. Well, there you go. I, don't, I, don't, I don't know that. God does, but God knows a lot of things he's not told me. Are you 